Only my first day, which I prepared for you. So, kids, once upon a time, there was the Flemish kingdom. One day, the king and queen got a beautiful painting. Of they named her Ilenke. <laughs> Two good witches came to visit her with a gift. One witch, one good witch, gave her a gift of a big mouth in order to be good at public speaking. And obviously, it's clear she has become an amazing public speaker and also stand-up comedian. I saw one of her stand-up live and some on YouTube and it was hilarious. The other witch gave her a gift of a long tongue in order to begin negotiations. And again, she gives us workshops and she teaches about negotiation and intercultural communication. But then, the bad witch came and told her, you'll be blown. Please, you can pause for Ineke Verbelen. Management especially likes to talk about change. 
Mm -hmm. And then we have things, whole uh, processes and methodologies about change management, and we must change and we have to change, and the world around us is changing, so we must change with. And sometimes I think it's such a load of BS. <laughs> and I've realized actually that it's not really such bullshit as I thought it was, because if you look at it, if you look just at the 20th century, and we are now the 21st century, we look only at the 20th century, the amount of change that happened in that one century is bigger than what happened in all the history of mankind, let's say since Neanderthal met Homo sapiens, so 40,000 years ago, happened. <coughs> when my great-grandmother met my great-grandfather, they knew they were made for each other. Because in the village, well, it was a kind of a big village, it was a small town in Belgium, where they met, they were the only two owners of a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> this is the late 19th century. So, these days, if I would, you know, say, my future, you know, prince has to have a bicycle, huh. um, I can't really narrow it down, you know? I would, you know, probably have to marry the whole world because everybody has a bicycle right now and those who don't are probably those who don't want to cycle but there's very limited. <laughs> Especially if I would go to Amsterdam. <laughs> I would think I want the guy with the three bicycles and then I would find one with four. But see, in the late 19th century, this was really an innovation. And the fact also that my great-grandmother rode a bicycle, and they didn't have female bicycles yet, so they had the big thing in them, and that she had made herself a pair of pants to ride on it, had the priest in the church make a sermon about um, modernity and how the world is going to end when we allow women to, you know, move on vehicles with two, with two wheels. So, this, this was the 19th century. And if we look at it now, then my grandmother, she saw in her lifetime, she saw the first car, she saw televisions, she saw dishwashers, washing machines, all these things that we now take for granted. But I look at my mom, in the beginning when the internet came, she was like, man, you know, one of those new fads, I don't need it. And now she's on Facebook, which I don't like. <laughs> I can't post everything because I have to do the mom screen in person. But if we see the amount of change, if you look only in when if I would look only at the IT world, and you look at something which is, which is called storage, so how we store stuff. Now at home we store our clothes in the, in the wardrobe. In IT, you store things on servers in databases. The IBM 360, which was a, had a relatively high storage capacity for the, for the late 70s, early 80s, had the storage capacity um, uh, you needed, you need, uh, I think about six, seven hundred of those IBM 360s to have the storage capacity of an iPod Nano. And an iPod Nano is already a thing of yesterday because it's like five years old already. Now, if you would take the weight of the IBM 360, you'd need a couple of million iPod Nanos to match the weight. So what we can store nowadays on ever smaller devices and it can access ever faster is obviously also changing the way that we act and changing the way we can do business. Now, so you see how, the, in the beginning, you know, from the bicycle to the car and then plane, train, the, the, the time difference between one innovation and the next is becoming increasingly shorter. Now, another thing that is accelerating this space, this, this change for organizations at large is our mobility. We have a completely new concept of mobility. If you wanted to go somewhere in the olden days, you had to think about, you know, how fast is my horse or how fast can I walk? And that, you know, gave you the idea of a day's trip. A day trip was either 40 kilometers if you're a bit sporty and you walk it, or about 100 kilometers if you have a good horse. And that was it. If I would have come to Prague here two centuries ago, I probably wouldn't have come for two days if I had 10 days of travel first to come here and then 10 days to go back, right? Nowadays, we can just, I was here in four hours with the bus and that was because the bus was stopped by the police for passport control. <laughs> but so the, <coughs> our sense of distance has shrunk with the speed with which we can travel. We can now travel across the globe in the span of <coughs> le less than one day if we take an airplane. We can go any place. 
And we do, because the third thing that has changed is our usage of time. The paid vacation is an invention of the middle of last century. The idea that you get paid whilst you're not working, and then you use this money to go and lie on a beach somewhere, to do nothing or relax. Also the concept of work-life balance, the concept of you work to live, and then you, you're, if you want to have a balanced life, you make sure that you have maybe an, an interesting hobby, you have a family, that you divide your time between the three. It's completely different than what we thought of working two centuries ago. Two centuries ago was get up at dawn, work your off until you go home to just eat, sleep, and wake up, and the next day the same routine. There was a concept of what they called holy days, but that was each time one day. And on that day, you were not allowed to work because you had to be in church. So it wasn't as if you were on a, on a holiday or vacation doing nothing or enjoying something that was for your personal betterment. But these three things, the fact that the pace of change is increasingly fast, the fact that we have a completely different sense of mobility, that we have become ultimately mobile, and I don't mean the phones, and the fact that our usage of time allows us to balance between work and free time, and to actually be paid for when you're not working, has uh, led us to come into contact with much more cultures, much more frequently. And not just as an expat or migrant, but also as a visitor, as a traveler. And this also means that organizations can get access to the whole world to sell, buy, and do business. Which has led to the fact, of course, that within businesses, you get um, what I would call cultural friction. But before we, we talk about cultural friction or how this can happen in an organization, I would like to have four volunteers for a little experiment. Two men and two women. Okay, you guys? Lara? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to be very, um, I would say, sexist here because I'm going to give the men male characters and the women the female characters. It's just because the task is going to be difficult enough than to try and you know be in, a, be in a different body. You will be Cinderella, and you will be Herda. Herda is the character in which is now called Elsa because of the film Frozen by Disney, but she's the heroine in the Snow Queen who mm. goes to the north of Lapland to save her friend. You will be the frog prince, <laughs> and you are Puss in Boots. Do we all know Puss in Boots? No. no. Oh, okay. So it's a, uh, it's a cat which was given to the youngest son of the mill owner, and the, the guy thinks, of course, the cat is worthless, but the cat has boots, and he is a very, very devious character who m makes sure that he convinces the king of the fact that his master is the Marquis of Carabas, yeah. and then actually <coughs> gets to marry the princess and becomes rich. So you are <coughs> Okay, now what I would like them to do is you have four different characters um, and you play your character. I've written a couple of notes on your character on the back side so you know the type of character you are. What they, have, uh, what they are is they are four uh, employees in Fairy Tales Inc. <laughs> now Fairy Tales Inc. has been set the task and they are the task force we set the task to update, revamp the fairy tales, the medieval fairy tales and folk tales <coughs> to the 21st century because the, the competition with uh, other types of, of games, online games and the likes, is very fierce and children don't buy the classic, you know, prince meets princess stories anymore. So that's what you have to do. Now what you do here for us is in about five minutes, you have about five minutes time, you will enact your kickoff meeting. You stay in character, and in the kickoff meeting you will do the usual, you have to negotiate a bit about timing, planning, the scope of the project, definition, budget, resources, the things that you think you will need. So staying in your character, you will here, for us, have your kickoff meeting for the big project of revamping the medieval fairy tales. All of them, not these ones. Not these ones, you are that character. Mm -hmm. So you are Cinderella in this case, and so you act like Cinderella, 
in the meeting. Mm -hmm. Does it work? Yes. Okay. Can you time five minutes? Maybe you can use it. Too. You can use it. <laughs> <laughs> down the activities that we need to do and then we see how we organize them. What's our goal? We need to we need to rewrite these fairy tales and then publish them and then spread them, start to sell them. Mm -hmm. to the but we don't want to lose the romance from No no no. <laughs> romance stays but we need to adapt them to the modern world. Because I think the uh, girls are there highly uh, underrated. They are all waiting for the please and they do nothing. So we need to show that they can do something, yeah. they can work in a corporation, they can achieve goals. And they don't need to wait for the prince, they can find their prince. <laughs> okay. So let's let's list the activities. So first... So uh, I'm Gerda, uh, it's a very uh, courageous uh, modern woman who is not waiting for the prince, but she goes to save the prince, to, to change him somehow. Mm -hmm. So she's going to travel, to, to use all the... Uh, more than facilities for that, playing. Uh, what else? Teleportation. <laughs> to come there and... Yeah. Before we enter into the details, yeah. because it's already okay. the of one story, I suggest to list the activities that we need to do. Uh -huh. So things like, let's see what is the list of the stories, where do we find these okay. stories, uh -huh. uh, who are the people that uh -huh. we come up with ideas, how to rewrite them, mm -hmm. people that can actually write them after we give them the ideas, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. So let's, let's brainstorm some mm -hmm. see what activities we, we should do. So the, basically, the princess, uh, the <coughs> girl is going to to, say, to get your princess. So this is what no, we, we, we should write all right? stories, stories, not only this yeah. one. Yeah? Okay. So first, let's let's uh -huh. see what, what are the stories. Ah. Uh, like Beauty and the Beast. Ah. Okay, so list of stories. Let's put it in this. You should see. <laughs> okay. And and I think uh, where can we find them? I mean, not only on our memory. I suppose they are somewhere in some libraries or Google. Yes. <laughs> Brothers Grimm. Brothers Grimm collection stories. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see the list and then we can we can we can brainstorm later. Ah, yes. So once we have the stories, uh, do we know who can come up with ideas how the stories are related, like you can your inspiration, uh, role models like the person that could be illustrated in the stories? Mm. Yeah, we should bring Brad Brad, Brad Pitt, in, you know, in to one of the male characters, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the modern version of the prince. B. Because he's still blonde, you know, handsome, so. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Not outdated. Who would be the ladies that we could use? What's the wife of Brad Pitt? <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, a, that's a good example, I like no, it. No, married, this is not modern. No, no, they're, they're married. <laughs> <laughs> but independent of yeah. the yeah. What's but the name of her? So, you know, I, I'm, I'm writing here the, the model, and I think that uh, we can use the model that we have the role models who could be our writers. Uh, we have the skills, we have, we have to hire somebody, some famous writers, some brothers. Well, Green, I don't like the name, it's kind of grey, whatever, I think it should name them differently. Yeah. So, some. What's some the writer writers. of Harry Potter? What's the name? Uh, Joe Jake Rowling. Ah, uh, exactly. She, she's great, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and then once we have this, we need to see, <coughs> I guess we need to do a schedule to see how many stories we have, how long we could take to uh, rewrite them. Maybe we can the throw all, this, all the stories uh, away if we've got J.K. Rowling, she's done some new stuff. Maybe Harry Potter is the modern version of those tales already written. Just 
Yeah, but the role of frogs in Harry Potter is not, you know, it's, it's not a really uh, a, 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 an example from what we use. <laughs> Maybe the frogs from nowadays, the yeah. unicorn. <coughs> the frogs only get... <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, frogs which can be transferred into prints. Oh, yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. My uh, <laughs> And um, yeah, you, you may sit down, but I'd like to ask you guys first how uh, easy or difficult you found playing in character. Yeah, I think to me it was pretty easy because this is what I do every day. <laughs> yeah. But did you feel it? Did you do it differently as Cinderella? Uh, as this Cinderella or not as Cinderella? As this one? This one I think is good because she was a hard working focused person. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's what I was trying to do. And there was also a girl that liked to party when it was the time, right time for it. So we have the chance now, but we can see later. Okay? <laughs> 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 but I think it fits well with yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. For me it was an impossible task since uh, the puss in boots. <laughs> Sounds like a stupid name, so it's <laughs> 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 that sounds like pussy in boots. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, the description was he tries very cunningly to do what his master says, but I didn't know what my master was, so it was a impossible task. Okay. Yeah, as, as Frog Prince, I, I was keen on change, but I didn't want any change that uh, went away from uh, frogs being kissed. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Mm. I, I found it difficult with Gerda for, uh, as I assume, Gerda is heading uh, away herself, mm. and she was like guided by Cinderella. It was difficult to follow her mind. <laughs> okay. Her thoughts. Okay. Any observations from the audience? Did you notice how they used the fairy tales, or was it just like a normal project meeting? <laughs> later the latter yeah okay <laughs> that was my impression too it was a little experiment but what i found is what i found interesting is that we still had four different characters on stage and we still had one person and clara of course grilling me afterwards agreed yes this is what i do every day so i took the lead and i went um and it took a while actually it took the whole five minutes for the rest to actually warm up and get into gear to you know help her out that was um, what I observed. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I did this is because I work... <coughs> no, I started actually working in Brussels in 2000, so a long time ago, in, in the time when the animals could still speak. And I worked for a German company, so of course, sooner or later, I was going to be sent to Germany, and I was. And when I came, at first, you know, my biggest culture shock was coming to Germany and noticing that Germans do work kind of differently than the Belgians. Mm -hmm. And it took me the full year to figure it out, you know, more or less, to be able to also work in the team without stepping on toes left, right and center, because my way of doing things was relatively different. But I was also uh, uh, equipped with the gift of the big mouth, so I didn't sit in the corner and wait until I understood how I could act with them. I spoke up and went back to Belgium and then I discovered that some of the things that the Germans did actually would help some of the Belgians because you know sometimes planning and organizing thing and having a really good concept of what you want to do the way the Germans like to plan would be helpful also for Belgians we more or less like to jump into things and then you know the planning is done as we go as we skip along now I then went back to Germany and I've stayed there now for a while, but my company was then sold to a French company and this is where it kind of turns interesting. Because as I'm Belgian, I understand French and I speak it too. But I was stuck between two cultures in the organization because it was two companies, roughly the same size, 35,000 uh, employees. So it wasn't like one company was buying the other and swallowing it or something, or, or one con it wasn't also like one company was able to, let's say, transport their organizational culture to the other company and the others had to adapt. It was really almost like a clash and 
on a work level, on a, let's say, organizational level, the integration went very, very fast. When I look back at it, because that was 2011, when I look back at it right now, 2015, almost 2016, almost five years later, I see that the cultural differences have not been solved at all. To add to the misery of some of my colleagues, last year the company bought a small French company on top. Mm -hmm. This has led to a situation in my part of the organization, in marketing, that <coughs> we have colleagues in global marketing who sit in Paris who do not speak a word of English. We sit, the marketing organization is split across the world, but we are more or less, you know, um, we're about 20 people in Munich, we're about 20 people in Paris, because um, that's how, that's how the, or we were 2020, or more, or less, more or less. We also have dual headquarters. Munich and Paris are both headquarters. So it's not like it's a French company with a seat in Germany or a German company with a seat in France. It's a European company with two headquarters. Um, when the new company arrived, we now have 50 colleagues in Paris. And I mean, some of them speak English really well with a nice French accent. But that's usually only charming and not limiting any, in any way. We, most of my German colleagues speak English with a German accent, which is also fine. So long as we speak and communicate, we have actually now colleagues in France who do not speak English and who, are, who have been given a global role, which is, I would say, also disastrous to them because they can't do what they have to do. The solution, of course, because we always find solutions when the management makes a mistake, on team level we found a solution, because I sit there in Munich and I speak French. So when a French male comes, my colleagues go, it again, you know, it's a French male, and so I go and I translate. Or when there was a huge misunderstanding in a telco, I called a colleague in Paris again to ask him what exactly they, he was trying to explain, you know. So we manage, we get along. But it is for me, and I, I know for a lot of my colleagues, not just sometimes funny, because it is sometimes funny. Sometimes very, it is very often very frustrating. I, at least once a week, I have a German colleague, when I sit in the office, slamming the phone shut, which is very hard to do when you have a headset, <laughs> slamming the phone shut mentally, you know, because he just presses the button with the mouse, you know. Um, and then, when he's thrown off his headset, yelling across the room, these stupid people from France, and I'm sure, at the other end of the line, we don't see this, I don't see it. There's some guy in France doing the exact same thing, these Germans, and what I would like to see is that my company adopts some of the, let's say, cultural lessons that you can learn from if you work with different cultures. Actually, you should see it as an enrichment and not as a burden. However, corporations usually jump into the global game without thinking of culture first. They think of culture as the last thing when things have already gone wrong. And it can cause a lot of friction. Some of the, you know, some of the main, uh, I would say, fault lines or the main uh, um, aspects of where culture can really play a role or can, can really change because you become a global organization is, for example, when you're a local organization, when you're, or actually when you are <coughs> in the global organization, part of your local team, a lot of the communication is done implicitly. You see someone and you ask them, can you do this, can you do that, and they say yes, and you see that in their eyes it says no. Now, if you're having the same conversation on the phone, and the other person says yes, but is thinking no, or doesn't really know how to do it, you don't see this, and you hear a yes, and you accept it as a yes. Body language goes lost, eye contact goes lost. Also, if you're both speaking globish, so if you're both non-native speakers of English, you have actually a double uh, interference. Because your English might not be perfect, my English is Belgian English, which was washed a bit by Colorado in the States, and now it's very, very, very much soaked in German culture. So my English is my English. You know, other people speak other versions of English. I have French colleagues who speak French English, so they will speak with English words, but <coughs> express French thoughts. My German colleagues are the same. They speak English with German ideas behind it. Now, if you don't understand that, you know, the conversation can also go wrong, go wrong because if it's the two people speaking the same language, the same native language, the unspoken 
gets understood immediately. Also, if need be, over the phone. But if you're both speaking globish, the implicit goes lost because you may not understand the, let's say, the American expression that your colleague was using because in your uh, context it just sounds like um, like something from, from football. American people like to use lots of expressions from sports. Now, you know, and it's a whole different ball game, for, for example, which are expressions which are perfectly all right in English, but they are very, very tainted by the American uh, sports culture, and we may not be so familiar with them if we don't, you know, if we haven't been there, if we haven't watched many American shows and the likes. So this implicit uh, communication gets lost when you work in a global organization. What has to come instead, I will talk about later. But another thing is also that there will be fault lines. It's like my, in my office, I notice very much that there's, there's a growing us versus them mentality. It is the French. It's never that colleague, you know? Because you are in a company of 90,000 people, the chances that you run into a colleague that you don't really like are, you know, of course. But if it's like the Germans, we are the good ones, and the French are the bad ones, and then the other side of the of um, the, the, the the border, they say they say the same things, and then of course we have Belgians also, and we have Dutch, and we have the Swedish, and we have the Americans, and we have the Indians. It's a global organization, and there's always something wrong with them. And so you create this us versus them mentality, and the organizational culture uh, can't really take shape because the national culture has put such a burden on the on colleagues and the, and the, <coughs> and has caused such a rift, such a fault line that people are sometimes beyond understanding. They don't want to understand anymore. You just you know and then you can have the issue, which in my company wasn't the issue, but we, I've seen it in other com companies where uh, there is a very strong corporate culture and this corporate culture is necessary to that organization. It's very important to them. For example, L'Oréal, you know L'Oreal, shampoo, makeup, things like that? L'Oreal um, has, over the past 20, 25 years, expanded globally massively. Now L'Oreal has a culture, corporate culture, or this corporate culture, of critiquing a lot. Questioning everything and giving critique. Now if you do that in, in Asia, people do not like open confrontation. They don't like open conflict because you might be losing face. You might lose, so you might put someone on the spot, which is something they can't do. Uh, and this will be, you know, very much the fact in other um, cultures that are where relationships are important, where the group belonging to the group is important. This confrontational thing. So Loria had to do something about it. I'll explain later what. Google is another one. Google is an American country uh, co company who has expanded into Europe also over the past 10, 15 years. And they have a very, very strong feedback culture. Now, feedback in the States is usually very rewarding. They, so Google has this, this set of, or, or this feedback form which says, first you have to give five um, items where your employee performed really well, and then one item where they could improve. So, so as to, you know, motivate, that was the, the way that Google wants to motivate their employees, because they also want creativeness, right? Now, when they entered in France, this is a completely different way of giving <coughs> feedback. In France, you know, the, the, the manager thinks, no, I have to, if I have this confrontation, not to be negative to the employee as a person, but I have to evaluate the work and I have to give him all the items where he could improve, you know, so that he knows, you know? And so they have to learn and adapt, and it has um, a an, an French manager of, uh, of, of Google recently said, uh, we are now a bunch of uh, French managers who give feedback in a very un-French manner. So you can learn, right? But in order to learn, you have to first be told, this is how we do things. Do you understand that this is how we do things? Can you learn to do You know, you have to be given the chance to learn. You be, if you're thrown in the lion's den and you don't know how to talk to the lions, then you're going to be eaten, right? But if you're thrown into the lion's den and you first had a trading into how to negotiate with lions, you might have a chance of survival. So there's uh, the differences. Now, I'll use my slides because I have them. <laughs> Here we go. So, um, taking all of that into, into account, 
as an organization, what could you do? Because if I, if I tell you that you have to take culture into account from the get-go, how can you do that? What are the, the items that you can work on without you know, giving everybody a set of rules and we must and we should and we shall and we do? Now, one thing which is very wise and very simple to do at first is to identify where the differences lie. Is it different because in certain culture, for example, uh, Germans and Swiss people are known to be extremely direct when they talk, you know, they say exactly what they mean. Now, in <coughs> cultures where um, people use more, I would say, flowery phases, more euphemisms in their, in their communication, this can clash. Now, if you know some of those dimensions, some of those dimensions where people might, might, uh, might differ, for example, putting a stress on individual achievement versus putting a stress on group and team relationships uh, can be something that can clash also. So if as an organization you kind of know, okay, we are European, and we're venturing out into Asia. What are the things that we need to take into account? And you put them on a chart and you know that not every last detail, because the, the list will be too long, but just, you know, let's say four or five items where you can think of, you know, these are things that people would do differently. Europeans will speak up much more, much more, much more eagerly. They will take the lead in, in meetings. Asians will sit back and wait until they're given instructions. So knowing that can help you to give everyone a voice. For example, if you have international telcos and uh, the headquarters dictates the language, and this might be English, it's very often English, but it might also be French, and the local companies would then you know, have the people on the line also speaking French. Well, first of all, you have the advantage as the native speaker. Secondly, you may have the advantage of coming from a culture where assertiveness is a value, where you are wanted to speak up. In other cultures, people do not speak until they're asked to speak. So this might lead to the misinterpretation that, you know, some of the, let's say some of the Asians would think, you know, they want us in the telco, but they never ask us to say anything. And the Americans on the other end of the line would be, you know, why are they so passive? Don't they have anything to say? Just specifically in telcos where you don't see people's body language around the table, just every 10 minutes asking, mm, Thailand, do you have anything to say? Singapore, what is your take on this China? You know, just asking it. Um, and it's something that some people do implicit, in, do automatically, that when they're in a telco, because you don't see people, they just ask, you know, are you still there? Do you, do you have anything to say? But if you'd forget and you just ramble on, you might lose touch, actually really losing touch, because people don't feel hear, heard, and you think they're not interested. So this giving people a voice explicitly can help there. Now, one thing which is a bit, um, I would say, different is when you have creative units. It might be your marketing department, it might be your product development department. When you have units that are very creative, that are the, the lifeblood of your organization, I'm thinking of um, a company like Louis Vuitton. They, they create um, suitcases and, and the likes, and it, they have a creative department which is, has a very strong culture within that department. You don't need to imply the explicit cultural rules on such a department because that might then uh, slow down the creative process. So you have to give them a bit of bandwidth to, to think about or to create stuff their own way. And this might be your marketing department, this might be your, your product development department, it might also be your R&D department, but where you rely on people being creative, you may say, okay, create your own norms, make sure that you have a, the, this creativity in, in, in place. Then an, an, a very good one is to train everybody in key norms. Now I was talking about um, L'Oreal earlier, where they want this confrontation, where they want this, this, this hard feedback. Now what they do is for in countries, uh, and for new employees now across the world, they give trainings in confrontation. So they just explain to them, how do we do, the, do things here? And they learn it, and they've actually had people from China where hard confrontation is really a no-go. You don't want to, to lo make anybody lose face. They've had people from China say, you know, this course has helped me to really speak up in meetings, and I know that in L'Oreal this is important, and I can do this now. Now, it doesn't say in the article whether they do it at home now too. I don't think so. <laughs> but 
just if you know this is my corporate culture, this is part of the corporate culture, then you can, if you have it defined, you can create a training about it. And if you have a training about it, then everybody has a chance to learn that skill. The same with the Google manager who learned to give feedback the American way. So things that you know, where you know, uh, my, that you know might cause friction, you can just train people in, in uh, learning to adapt to that, to that behavior. And then, and this is the most important one uh, uh, of all, you have to try and be heterogeneous everywhere. If your HR department sits in London and they're all, let's say, 99% UK and the vast majority female and all of them more or less <coughs> in their late 40s and then your engineering department sits in Shanghai and they're a young man between 20 and 30 and um, they're all from Shanghai, you're asking for trouble. If you have and this is what most corporations actually do very well. If you have the chance to give people a global career and you have expats everywhere, then on the one hand, people from headquarters can bring uh, knowledge from headquarters to the local countries, but when they return, if they return, or if someone from a local country goes to global, they can bring back what are the, the real uh, needs and issues on the ground. What is it that, that makes people in the local country Thick, or what is it that they do differently? And I know that from my experience, when I came from Belgium, local country, and specifically very small country, to headquarters Germany, where first of all the, the country in itself is very big, and then of course this was headquarters of the country, I brought back some some things that I where I said, you know, but this this might help in dealing with countries because if you just do things differently, and so by having many, and we are very heterogeneous. In the office in, in Munich, we are, have one um, Chinese Singaporean, one um, half Greek, half Italian lady. There's me from Belgium. There's someone <coughs> from the UK. There's someone from Romania. And we've got some Germans too. So it is, our team was very heterogeneous before we had the merger with the French company. And we are still, we still are. Unfortunately, we have no French people here sitting here, which might also help in the, in, the, in the negotiations. And unfortunately, in my opinion, there's uh, not very many expats in Paris, in our company. There could be more. There are a few, but there are not so many. But if you, as a company, if you have a good mix, and it's not just you know nationalities or cultures, it's also age groups and male, female, making sure that the ratio is like a fair representation of what the world look like, looks like, you have a better chance at overcoming cultural hurdles, hurdles before they come up. So my message would be that you shouldn't be like the wolf and expect that the world continues the way it always was and that your old strategies and old ways of working are going to help you forever. But think about it more like a little red riding hood and adapt to new situations, find new ways of doing things, and wherever you go, try and adopt, ad adopt culture in your organization before things go wrong. There's no time for trial and error with this, you know? The time you lose will also make you lose out on competition. It's, this is really a, a, a matter of adapt or perish.